So tonight we're going to share um, about faith, hope, and love. The very last scripture in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, which says, And now uh, this three remain, faith, hope, and love. And uh, so we're going to have an interesting approach. Uh, Pastor Conrad and Pastor Peter and myself, we're going to um, collectively share the word this evening. So Pastor Conrad is going to share on faith, and then uh, Pastor Peter directly after that is going to share on hope, and then um, I'll end off with love. All right, have you got an expectation? I believe God's going to do something tonight in your lives. Amen. So, uh, Pastor Conrad. Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's awesome to be with you. Just before we start, I just felt something during worship, and I just want to step out of obedience. Um, is there anybody here you've broken your arm either three times or in three places in the past? And sometimes you're like a rain man. You've got arthritis or pains in your arms and stuff like that. Is there anybody here who's broken their arm more than once? I get the make up hot my body parking. Yeah. Okay, not here. All right, I'll speak to Zander later then. I thought it might be him. <laughs> All right, great. So I'm here to share about faith. And um, very well-known scripture in Romans 10 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Amen. Now, there's many different ways we can apply our faith and practice our faith. And I'm just going to highlight a very important thing, which I believe is an important principle regarding faith and the use of our faith. I'm not saying we can't use our faith in any other way. But I've found that when we don't use our faith in this way, we, we can set ourselves up for disappointment. The scripture says faith comes by hearing the word of God, hearing God's word. That says to me that when I want to operate in, by faith, the only thing I can actually put my faith in is in God's word, what God says to me, either through his word or through his Holy Spirit in me. That is the basis for my faith. Many times we... I think sometimes we, uh, we could be naive, we could be growing in our faith, and I think sometimes we apply, apply our faith in different ways where we don't know what God's saying about a situation, but I just have faith for this to happen. I, uh, and I put my faith in something that I, that I desire or that I believe God wants for me, but I don't have a word from God, and I'm not saying that's wrong. But I want to highlight an important principle, which I believe is very important for this season that we're entering into. We, we are in the last days. We are in times where, where things are constantly changing. And as you see with this, this, this epidemic that swept the, the, the planet, the restrictions have come and all sorts of things have happened. And I really believe hearing God's voice is essential in this time. Hallelujah. When we look at the, discer the discerning of spirits, these type of gifts, I think they are vitally important for these end times. And when we're walking in faith, I believe hearing God's voice is one of the most important principles I can learn regarding faith. I struggle very much to put my faith into something God has not yet said to me. Or that God has not said, that I'm trusting God for. Now I said, as I say, it's not wrong to say I'm trusting God for this. But I know that when God gives me a word, I can lay my whole life down on it. I can put my 100% to it, knowing that it, that it will happen, that God is faithful, that God is true. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. So when God, when God speaks a word to me, that is something I can put my faith in. And a, a, very, a very good chapter for, for, for faith is Hebrews 11. And it talks about the hearers of faith. It says, Hear, uh, the hearers of faith, and we talk about Abraham and Noah and all of these guys. And I just want to highlight two examples this evening of these hearers of faith. And just to learn one or two things from them briefly. So the first one I want to look at is just, is first of all, Abraham. And I'm just going to read from verse 8 to verse 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. 
By faith he dwelt in the land of a promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Sorry, I'm just trying to find a, a note I wrote here. There we go. Ten minute preach. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So the first thing we learn from Abraham is God said, God said to him, take your family, take everything you own and leave this place and go to a place that I will show you. Now, at the moment, I really personally, I personally identify with uh, Father Abraham because um, we are in a similar process. Uh, we, in two weeks time, we leave Bloemfontein, but we are going to go plant a, a church in, in the Middle Eastern region and the Caucasus and... Um, I, I, fully, I fully sympathize with Abraham because God said, just go. Take up your stuff, take your family, take your, your belongings, leave your job, everything. Go to a land that I will show you. He didn't even say, go to this land. I don't even know if he said, go north, east, west, south, whatever. He just said, go and I'll show you where to go. He had no idea what lay ahead. But God said, and therefore, he stepped out in faith. Amen? May we have this trust in God. The second thing we see is that he moved out of his comfort zones. Faith brought him out of his comfort zone. It's a challenge. I'm a husband and a father, and a move like this is extremely challenging. You're selling all your stuff. I mean, all I own currently now is a freezer. Sold my car, sold my couches, gave my bed away, whatever. And I have, I have a freezer now. That's be <laughs> no, you can't have it, buddy. <laughs> All right? And now we're just waiting to go. And we don't know what awaits us that time. We've been there briefly for, uh, for a few weeks. But it's a huge decision as, as, a, as a husband you are making decisions for, and, and uh, as a husband and, husband and a father, financially, it's a, it's a huge thing. It's a huge phase step. You, you have to hear from God how you're going to provide, um, what's going to happen. And if you don't have any of those answers, it doesn't matter. God said. But God is not a man that he should lie. He places his word above himself. That is how I know that he will do what he says. There's nothing higher than God, so he cannot put his word higher than anything but himself. He places himself on his word. That's how I know what he has said he will do. And that's the only thing I have to go on is his character and his Godhead, his faithfulness to his word. I, I, I struggle, as I said, to step out in something that God has not said. We, we, I knew for a long time, even before I got married, I was going to go to that region and plant a work there. And when, even before my wife and I got married, we both knew we were called to that region. And God kept on confirming it, confirming it, and we never knew where. Until the season came, and I would not, I said to God, I am not moving from this place until you kick me out with your word. I'm not going unless you say so. Has there been lots of opportunities? Yes. I even tried one of the opportunities to the same country I'm going. I had the country in my spirit. I felt this is where God was sending me. But I wasn't sure of the opportunity. But I applied for the job anyway. And I didn't get it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but at the right time, at the right season, God came and He released the word over my life, over our lives. And now I'm going, not sure of what, I'm, what awaits me, not sure all the puzzle pieces are not fitting together, but I know this is what God said. So therefore, I can move out of my comfort zones. I can take the financial risk. Hallelujah. And I can step out in what God said. Now, there's something very interesting there. Let me just read this again, verse 8, 9, and 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go out to a place which he would receive in his inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, 
the heirs with him for the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He never bought land. The only land that he ever bought was the land to bury his wife in. But he lived as a foreigner, as a sojourner in his places, and he never owned land. Because he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was waiting for a city whose builder and maker is God. He had a picture in his spirit of what God had said to him. And he was going to wait for that. You see, we need to be able to see what God is saying. That is what stirs faith. Hallelujah. Because when I look at my, my, my circumstances, when I look in the natural, I will not necessarily see what God is saying. It will look impossible. It will look improbable. It will look difficult. It will, it will drown out my faith. Are you with me? But when I have a picture in my spirit of what God is saying, I can place all my faith into it because I know that is what God said. Hallelujah. The picture, the reality of what, of what God is saying in your spirit must be greater than the reality of your circumstances and what you see in the natural. It must be more real. The reality of the picture that you see of, in your spirit that you receive from God must be more real than what you see in your circumstances and in the natural. Then you are walking by faith, not by sight. The just shall live by faith. Abraham, God said, look at, these, look at these stars and see if you can count them. And God said, your descendants will be more than that. And the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And this is how these men of faith work, walked. Amen. The second guy we're going to look at is, is, is Noah. And he's in verse 7. By faith, Noah being divinely warned. Everyone say divinely warned. God spoke to him, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. So Abraham was going to a place that he had not yet been or didn't know where he was going. Noah was being warned of something he had not yet seen. As far as I understand, correct me if I'm theologically incorrect there, uh, uh, Pastor Val. But I don't believe they had seen rain yet. Up until that point of time. And all of a sudden, God is telling him, build a boat. Now, in my imagination, when I visualize this scripture, I imagine him building a boat in Bloemfontein. Because <laughs> if he's building a boat in Cape Town, it not, not, doesn't take much faith. Are you with me? But I just see this dry, flat place, and here God says, build a boat. A massive one. And all the animals are going to come. How? I don't know. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. With godly fear for what? His voice. Amen? Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. God warned him of something that he had never seen in his life before. It was, beyond, it was beyond his circumstances and his logic and his understanding. He had never seen this before. It was not logical to build a boat where he was. And it was beyond his understanding because he had never experienced something like it before. But yet moved with godly fear because he knew it was God speaking to him. He started to build the ark. What are we saying? We've got it. We've got God's voice will tr transcend your understanding, will transcend your logic. Sometimes we like to evaluate so much and we call it wisdom. I shared the example in one of my previous sermons of, or in one of my previous classes. Uh, my sister in law, Salome, was getting married and uh, the, the weather. The weather forecast was very negative for that day when we were there, when we arrived. And so the, the father and then the sons-in-law, me and Adam, and we were standing together as the wise men, the wise counsel. And now we're preparing a plan B just in case it rains on his, her wedding. So we're looking at the tents we have and how we can maneuver things. 
And Salome walked past while we're having this discussion. And she just said, no, stop that right now. It's my wedding and it's not going to rain. You're not even going to prepare this way. I'm telling you it's not going to rain. <laughs> okay. And it was a beautiful day. It was a sunny day. But we in our manly wisdom were, you know, we consider it wisdom when we want to logically work out things. God wants you to use your common sense and your brains, yes. But not when it comes to something he said to you. We don't need to evaluate what God said. You don't even need to fully understand what God said. But if you understand what you need to do, that's fine. Hallelujah. So it's sometimes going to transcend your logic and your understanding. My, my notes are in Afrikaans here. He didn't see or understand, but he, he, was, he, he was obedient. Amen. So this is what I see faith as. Faith is hearing God's voice and obeying. I don't like to put my faith in something that God has not said to me or that God has not revealed to me. And I think this is a really important prophetic gifting that we need in these end times. Is for you to accurately hear God's, faith, uh, God's voice and step out in faith in that. And then you're going to see the miraculous. Then you're going to see the breakthroughs. Then you're going to see God's will come and God's kingdom come. Amen? Amen. Pastor Peter, could you take over here? Who of you have had a pet rat before? Pet rat. David? Nobody? Right this morning, there was a lady that had a pet rat, uh, Afrikaans lady. Obviously, a pet rat and or rat in Afrikaans is called a rot. I asked her what she called it, and she called it a roti. <laughs> right, that's something that you eat, in my opinion. Any of you eaten a roti? <laughs> Have you eaten a rat? Oh, praise God for you. Right in the 1950s, um, uh, Professor Kurt Richter um, performed a study. He was trying to prove a specific point where he took domesticated rats, tamed rats, what you would call pet rats, and he took wild rats, these things you find on the streets, these things that look like they're on steroids. Right? You don't want to look you don't want to know what their mothers look like if they look like that. All right. So these these two different um, breeds of rats. And um, the first test with the domestic rats, he, he put these rats, domestic rats or pet rats, one by one in a, a jar of water to see how long they would be able to swim before they were drowned. How sweet is that? All right, before they would drown. Okay, and to his surprise, these domestic rats, um, some of them lasted a few days. Right, some of them lasted a few days. So then he came to the steroid looking rats that are known for their ability to swim. Right, they are known to be good swimmers. And he put these rats one by one in these jars, and within a few minutes, they all drowned. Within a few minutes. There was a difference between a domestic rat, a pet rat, and a wild rat. Right? So then he performed the test again, and he tried something differently. Right? He put the wild rat back in the water, not the dead one. A different one, okay? He put the, the rat in the water, and just before it started sinking in, he pulled the rat out, gave it some hope, gave it a chance to breathe, right? Let it rest a little bit. And then he put it back in the water. And to his surprise, this rat 
could swim longer than what it did before. Right? Longer than what it did before. Why? Because this rat had hope that maybe, just maybe, if I continue swimming, somebody will pull me out. With those pet rats, those pet rats could swim for days because they've been nurtured. They know that someone's going to be there to help them. Someone's going to be there to feed them. There was no situation of hopelessness. So what this Professor Kurt Richter um, concluded from this um, study, his words were, after the elimination of hopelessness, the rats did not die. After the elimination of hopelessness, the rats did not die. So when we eliminate hopelessness from the equation, you position yourself for a faith invasion. Amen. Doesn't that sound awesome? Say that again, sister. <laughs> right? There we go. It's so good. So good. Right? When we eliminate hopelessness from the equation, we position ourselves for a faith invasion. Turn to the person next to you and say, position yourself for a faith invasion. Amen. So hope, I'm speaking about hope, and hope as the anchor for the soul. Why the anchor for the soul? Hebrews 6 verse 19 says, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul. And I just want to focus on that tonight because, man, there is so much to say about hope. When I went and dig in this theme, I couldn't choose what to talk about. So I'm going to just try and summarize just on this hope, the anchor of the soul. So let's just quickly look at a few definitions of the word hope. So one of the English um, dictionary definitions for hope is a feeling of expectation. It's a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. A feeling or an expectation. One of the Greek meanings for the word hope is to wait, to be patient, and to endure. I want you to remember that because later we're going to touch on a scripture that doesn't say hope, but it means hope. To wait, to be patient, to endure. One of the Greek meanings for hope. In the Old Testament, hope is linked with Putting your confidence in something. Right? Putting your confidence in something. That is to hope. And then also to take refuge in something. That's weird. To take refuge in something is also to hope. To take refuge in His Word. To take refuge in who He is. Is to have hope. I would have thought that's to have fear. To run away. But to have hope is to find refuge in God. Finding refuge in who he is. Bill Johnson, just a little sentence that he had. He said, joyful um, hope is to have, well, is joyful anticipation of good. Joyful anticipation of good. It is not a wish it becomes an atmosphere that attracts the promises of God. Hope becomes an atmosphere that attracts the promises of God. So when you stand with hope, one of the, one of the other sentences over here is a, a steady expectation of good from God. When you stand with a steady expectation of good from God, you attract the attention of God. You attract the attention of God. You create an atmosphere that attracts the promises of God. When you stand with hope. And hope is not wishing. I wish, I wish. When you wish, you put your faith in luck. When you wish, you put your faith in luck. But when you hope, biblical hope, 
when you get the correct definition of hope, when you get this right in your head, right? Then you become, you create an atmosphere that attracts the promises of God. You don't rely on luck. You position yourself with faith in God. Amen? Hallelujah. Position yourself for a faith invasion. Right, so I read a quote um, on Dr. Google. And I, I can't remember who the quote was from, but it said the following, Hope is knowing that something is possible. It's knowing that something is possible. It is possible. God can do this. Faith is believing that nothing is impossible. Faith is believing that nothing is impossible. So hope, the anchor of the soul. Hebrews 6 verse 19, I'm going to read that piece again. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul. So what is the purpose of an anchor? What is the purpose of an anchor? Can anybody tell me? I see you all silent. No, that's a whip. Is a whip. Okay? You will not be able to beat someone with an anchor. Okay. All right. I get you. Anybody else? Good. Okay. What is the purpose of an anchor? To prevent the craft from drifting due to wind or current. To prevent the craft from drifting due to wind or current. Sometimes the storms come. Sometimes the waves come and want to toss you over, want to push you away, want to drive you away. But are you anchored? Are you anchored? How are you anchored? Hope is an anchor. Sometimes it's not the storm waves or the storm winds that come to move you away. Sometimes it's just that current, that lazy current, being pushed with the tide of society, being pushed with the flow. We can get so lazy or we can be so, how can I say it, so naive that we don't see how we are just drifting away with the current, drifting away with the fears, drifting away with this or with that. Who is or what is the anchor? In Psalm 71 verse 5, David says, God, you are my hope. Hope is not just a feeling. Hope is not just an expectation. Hope is a person. Hope is a person. Titan, hope is a person. Jesus Christ, unshakable, unmovable. Hope is a person. See, there's a difference between divine hope and natural hope. In Jeremiah 29 verse 11, um, God says to his people, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I am giving you a hope. That hope that God gives you is a divine hope. It's not just a natural hope. Because Jesus also says in John 14, 27, peace I give you, not as this world gives. So there is a natural peace and there is a divine peace. There is a natural hope and there is a divine hope. In Romans 4, verse 18, it says that Abraham hoped against hope. What, what, what on earth is that? To hope against hope. There is a divine hope that empowers, overpowers, sorry, that overpowers a natural hope. When God speaks and everything looks hopeless, there is a hope.
that rises above your natural hope. When you've hoped as much as you can, there is a divine hope that hopes beyond. Divine hope that overpowers natural hope. So beyond just this anchor, there is an anchor cable or an anchor road or an anchor chain, which is so important because you can't just hook up the ship to, to an anchor with a thin, small chain, right? That thing's going to break. That thing's going to break. So the chain that you have needs to be strong, right? And how do you build yourself? How do you strengthen this chain? You need to build yourself spiritually. You need to strengthen yourself. How do I strengthen myself? Well, James 1, go read James 1. That first verse, that first three, four verses um, says it quite nicely. Build yourself up in faith. Build yourself up in maturity. Build yourself with endurance. Build yourself with faith, right? Build yourself in teachability, flexibility, accountability, right? I'm rushing through these things. Just get the flipping audio, okay? Um, build yourself in the Word, right? Not just in reading the Bible, but also in the rhema word, the spoken Word of God, okay? Build yourself in prayer. Jude verse 20 says, build yourself up in your faith by praying in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Build yourself up by obedience. Knowledge puffs up, okay? But I need to put all of these things into action. Action. You can see that I haven't been active in a long time. And then also, how do I strengthen this anchor cable? Is by being connected accurately with community. Strengthening my connection with the body of Christ. Because when those storms come, who is there to support me? How strong are the relationships around me that will keep me to my faith? Or will I have people standing next to me and saying, yeah, it's hopeless. Look at Job's friends, right? What kind of people do you surround yourself with? Another point on this whole anchor situation is how far will you allow yourself to drift? When we lose hope, when we get hurt and lose hope, we get angry. How long will you allow yourself to get angry, to stay angry? How long Will you allow yourself to feel down, to feel hopeless? We get upset, but how long will you stay upset? Right? We lose hope, we become angry, we become bitter. Be careful that you don't become disconnected. Because the longer you entertain these things... The more, in danger, you, the more you endanger yourself from becoming disconnected. Disconnected from the body of Christ. Disconnected from your relationship with God. Because how many of you have ever felt that, that when you're hopeless, you just don't want to read your Bible? When you're hopeless, you just don't want to pray. You just don't want to go to church. You just don't want to spend time with God. Because I'm angry right now with God. Where was he? Why didn't he answer my prayers? And it's so easy to get disconnected. And this unfortunately shows how you've built yourself, how you've strengthened yourself, how you've fortified your spiritual life. 
strengthen yourself so that when the storms come, yes, you will come to that place of feeling down and out. But you can stand up again. And when you are weak, you've got the right people around you to help you stand up again. Don't forfeit your future by hijacking your hope. Don't forfeit your future by hijacking your hope. I don't see anybody writing that. I thought that was cool. But anyway. Okay. Don't forfeit your future by hijacking your hope. Right? You can get... Yeah. Entertaining your emotions will only cause you to drown under the waves of deceit. Entertaining your emotions will only cause you to drown under the waves of deceit. Time is against me. What is the source of your hope? Where do you find hope? What gives you hope? What creates hope in you? A better future. Is God the source? Or what is the source? Jeremiah 29, 11, I give hope and a future. Psalm 121, where do I, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Him, right? He is my source. Isaiah 40, verse 31, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. What did we say is one of the Greek definitions for the word hope? To wait. Those who wait upon the Lord. Some of the translations say those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. What do you hope for? Do you hope for what God hopes for? Is your hopes in alignment with God's hopes? I will give you a hope and a future. Well, God, what are you hoping for? What is your hope for my life? Because I want my hope to be aligned with your hope. I don't want to strive and fight, put my hope in something that's going to tap all my energy. And at the end of the day, I'm sitting there <sighs> trying to figure out, should I wish and put my faith in luck? Or am I going to try to continue putting hope in this thing? Right? How do I strengthen my hope? We, we gave a few pointers there previously. I'm strengthening myself, but Psalm 42 verse 11 says, hope in God. Hope in God, for I will yet praise me, speaking to his soul. Why are you so down? Why are you so hopeless? Put your hope in God, right? Hope in his word, Psalm 119 verse 114. Hope in his unfailing love, Psalm 130 verse 7. And those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Be joyful in hope, Romans 12, verse 12. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I just want to give this one example. Okay. Hey, God. Um, for those of you that don't know her, um, Abraham's servant, servant, wife, servant, lady. They, they couldn't fall pregnant, so hey, um, Sarah gives, gives um, Abraham the, the servant, and she falls pregnant. And now that she's pregnant, um, she starts despising um, Sarah. Now, Sarah obviously gets jealous and gets, uh, she's not happy with this whole situation. So she is she doesn't treat this um, lady quite well, and she sends her away into the desert, right? So this woman is pregnant. She's sent into the desert, right? This woman is hopeless, right? She's at a well. She's crying. She's crying, and the angel of the Lord comes and meets her there and speaks to her and says, go back, and she, he, he blesses her and speaks promises over the, the child, 
in the womb and all of that kind of thing. And there she, she says that she calls the well the God who sees. So in this hopeless situation, there is a God who sees. And then there is a second situation where her son is a bit older and they get, they, they get told to leave again. Now they run out of water and Ishmael is dying because of dying of thirst. She's dying of thirst, but she can't bear the sight of looking at him, watching him die. Their situation is hopeless. Just imagine your husband has had to tell you to leave. But Abraham, we've had this child together. We brought this child up together. Now you're chasing me away. This child is going to die now. Now I have to look and see how my child is dying because of thirst and hunger. Angel of, the, angel of the Lord comes and he says, I have heard your cry. In this hopeless situation, there is a God who hears. Sometimes when we are hopeless, we want someone just to see me in my situation. We want someone just to hear me in my situation. But he doesn't just stop there. He also feels your pain. Isaiah 53, right? I was bruised. What? Pierced for your transgressions. What? Pierced for your, crushed for your, I can't remember. But he was bruised, he was pierced, he was crushed. All right? He felt, he suffered. He's a God who sees your hopelessness. He's a God who hears. He's a God who feels. In whom do you hope? In whom do you find refuge? Because that is hope. Do you find hope in an emotion? Or do you find hope in a person? Jesus Christ. The anchor. The anchor. Amen. Thank you. So, of course, we're still talking about faith, hope, and love. And um, so I'm going to end off with love. So I read a recently an article by, uh, written by a fellow called uh, John Marrow. And uh, for those of you who know, John Marrow is a, quite a, you know, a well-known and well-published uh, writer, especially for online articles and material. Um, apparently, they project that his writings have already touched 6 million people worldwide. And he wrote an article in 2012 that I read. And um, that specific article, uh, already 1 million people read that article. And I want to share that with you because I believe, um, you know, I just experienced God wants to use this story um, to open up something new, something fresh to us about his love. And I shared this morning the way in which I see love. The, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13 says now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And love is for me like, almost like the glue that brings everything together. Because it says uh, for the greatest of these things is love. And so it, it's the perfect bond of unity that ties everything together. And I just believe God wants to open us up to us uh, His love and His definition of love in a fresh and a new way. Oftentimes, we use the word love. Uh, I think it's a word in the English language and in any other language that we use very often. But do we really understand what is God's definition of love? And uh, when I went uh, yet again over 1 Corinthians 13, there's one specific verse that just popped out to me. And um, God, I just experienced how the Holy Spirit just made it fresh to me and opened up some dimensions about God's love for us. And um, I also believe how we need to love one another. So the article that I read starts with um, this doctor that opens the dialogue or the speech, the conversation. And he tells the lady in his consultancy room that... Um, I've got very bad news for you. 
And so uh, John Merrow writes, and I couldn't detect whether it was his life story or he was writing about somebody else, but he was writing in the first person, so I'll just take it that, that he wrote about himself. Um, and, and his mother went to the doctor because at one year old, he was one year old then, he couldn't crawl. You know, his little legs just dragged behind him as he pulled himself forward. And, um, and the doctor shared with his mother that, um, that he actually has got a, a specific di di disease that makes the muscles along the spine at his back deteriorate. And the doctor starts to share with his mother that this, this condition will just continue. It will just become worse and worse until uh, your son will not be able to move by himself anymore. And he, that, that sickness will bring him up to a point where he wouldn't be able to breathe by himself. And most probably one day he will catch an infection and that will, that will um, translate into pneumonia. And then your son will die, most probably before the age of two. And the mother looked at the doctor and she said, my son will not die. And he says, ma'am you must understand that your son will not be able to fight. You know, he will, will not have the ability to fight this. And she again looked at the doctor and she said, he will not have to fight because I will fight for him. And then he explains that for, from that moment, for the next 16 years, he contracted pneumonia 16 times. And how his mother just got... a a whole group of doctors together to work with him, how she slept in the hospital uh, in a chair next to his bed, oftentimes for 30 days on end, and how she would, you know, just, just um, oh, what's clop, um, pat him on the back to, to loosen the mucus so that he does not catch pneumonia and does not get pneumonia. And that actually pulled him through. In 2012, when he wrote the article, he was 27 years old, the oldest person that actually survived this, um, this spinal uh, muscular um, atrophy. And, um, you know, a record, the oldest person that actually survived this. But his mother didn't stop there. He, um, she actually continued and she said, it's not good enough that my son lives. He must also have a good life. And so what she did, she, um, they didn't want to allow him in a, in a normal school uh, with normal kids and she went to the board members of that school and she nagged them until they allowed him into the normal school. And when he wanted to play basketball and didn't want to allow him on the team, she went to the coach and said, my son must play. And eventually they rewrote the rules of basketball to allow her son onto the basketball team. And then at the age of 16, due to this condition, he lost the grip on his pen. He wasn't able to hold the pen anymore. And his mother then got uh, permission to pull in a college student to actually write the exams for him. Of course, you know, he must dictate now. And, um, and he got his um, grade 12, his matriculation at the age of, age of 16 and uh, with university exemption and he, you know, could go further. And then he ends off the section by saying, that is the love or actually the miracle of a mother, to fight for her children, not giving up, not taking no for an answer, but to fight and to push through for the best that she believes that child can have. And I believe in a certain way that that encapsulates God's love for you and for me. And I believe that's the kind of love that we should have for one another, pure, godly unselfish love that refused to take no, but that pushed through and that fights until I see the full potential and the full plan of God and, and the full picture that God dream, dreamt you should have and that should materialize in your life and that Jesus Christ paid the price for until that starts to take form in you. Amen? So let's go to, um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and uh, verse 7. And it's, I'm just going to read this one scripture, and um, I believe that God just showed me four dimensions of this kind of love. All right, and we're quickly going to touch on each one of those 
It's going to latch onto what Pastor Conrad said. It's going to latch onto what Pastor Peter said. And um, I trust that God will just show us how His perfect love, His pure godly love, just binds everything together. Amen? In 1 John it says, we love because He loved us first. In Romans chapter 5 it says, you know, God poured out His love in our hearts. First to love ourselves, right? But also then to love others, right? And as we speak, as we read from the Word, I want to urge you, I want to ask you to open up your heart that God's Holy Spirit will just come and pour out His pure godly love in your heart. That you can accept it anew uh, for yourself, but that you can also become a channel of His pure and His godly love towards other people, all right? And I believe there are four dimensions to this. So, in verse 7 it says, it speaks about love. And of course, the previous verses uh, tells everything what love is not, uh, predominantly. In verse 7 it says, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Right? It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And always perseveres. Right. So the first one is God's love always protects. It always covers. It always embraces. It always encompasses. And um, the first thing that I just want to say is oftentimes this scripture is misunderstood in the body of Christ. Because some people take it that because God, God's love protects, because it covers because His love covers a multitude of sins, we think that we don't have to open up our sins and we don't have to confess it. But we can just keep it secret and, and cover it up. That is not what that scripture means. Because 1 John 1 says that we must walk in the light as He is in the light. In other words, we must bring our ugly stuff, our sin and, um, and everything that we want to hide. And in the perfect love of God, we feel safe enough that we can open up and bring it to the light so that there can be healing. Right? So, um, Dr. Masibuku, I want to use this analogy. Um, so, sometimes we think in the body of Christ, if we've got a, you know, a, what's a swear? Sorry, I struggle with the English. A, a abscess, is that the right word? All right, the abscess, we want to cover it up up with a plaster or a bandage, and, and we want to hide it from the world, and nobody must see it, and we believe, you know, as long as we don't see it and anybody else don't see it, you know, we, we're going to be okay. Well, that's not God's love for you. God is a good doctor, with all respect, and He wants to come with His love in a way that you trust Him, you trust His character, and that he will come very skillfully and open up the abscess and take out the negative stuff and the bad stuff and put in the good stuff and then cover it up with his love. Amen? That's who he is. He's, he's a good God. We, we, we sang it this morning. We sang it this evening. He's a good God. And the word says that the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance, all right? The kindness of God leads us to repentance. That means that if God steps in with his love and you feel it, you feel safe and you're willing to open up. And I believe that's also the kind of love that God wants to, us to, to channel towards other people, all right? So if there's still something inside of you where you want to withdraw from people, and you don't want to open up. And I'm not saying, you know, make yourself, you know, absolutely vulnerable in that level to everybody. No, no, no. But God has placed some leaders and some key people in your life where His love will touch your life and create a safe space in a safe environment where you should open up. Why? Because God wants to bring healing and restoration in every part of your life. Amen. I believe God's heart. The, one of the goals in this dimension specifically. Is for you to see whole people in the body of Christ. And also in your life. Amen. 
God's heart is for you. And I know sometimes it can be scary what we're talking about, opening up. But that's the way God wants to bring healing in your life, through that dimension. Amen. It always protects. It always covers. It always embraces, no matter what the past and the wrongdoing and what's inside the abscess. Amen. The second thing, it always trusts. All right. Trust, in, um, it could also be translated in a different way um, as faith, right? It always believes. It always trusts. Now, I'm not going to repeat what, what Pastor Conrad said um, because I, I believe what he said is, is um, you know, really from the heart of God. But what I want to underline is when we talk about trust, when we talk about belief, I want to reiterate what Pastor Conrad said, and that is that you should develop the ability to see in the Spirit what God's heart is, what His plan is, and what, he, what, what He's got installed for you, and that must become your reality. There's a direct correlation between what you see in the Spirit, the potential that you see in the Spirit, and how you position yourself in faith. Amen? And I believe if we bring in love, what you should see is that God believes in you, Renske. Right? So we've quoted Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Pastor Peter quoted it. But do you really believe that the plans that he's got for you are plans uh, to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future? Can you see the potential? Can you see the future that God has got for you? We read this prophetic word of our congregation when we started this, this sermon. But I want to ask you, was it just another prophetic word that you just thought, all right, it's just a random guy in, in, um, in Ghana that sent it to us, another prophet, another prophecy? Or do you really believe this is the potential that God sees in us sitting here as a congregation? I'm asking you. Because God believes in you and me that this will be a reality. That's his faith. That's what he believes. And that's also true for each one of you. Amen? That's his heart. That's his love. God believes in you. And in the same way, I believe God wants me and you to believe in people. Somebody once said that, is there somebody in your life that believes more in your potential than what you see in yourself? That's spiritual fathering. I'm going to say it again because I want you to remember. I'm asking you the question, is there somebody in your life that believes more in your potential? In other words, see more inside of you what you can achieve and who you can be than what you believe in yourself. That's the heart of spiritual fathering. Amen? And I pray that God will just come and open up this dimension, the second dimension of his love, more and more in our midst. Amen? When we, when, 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 some of us get the despondent and we believe we're not making an impact and we want to withdraw to say, no, God believes more in you and you can achieve more than, uh, than what you're talking about. So um, let me just share this thing. I'm, uh, some of you know that I'm, I'm uh, uh, sort of involved in the field of what I call cognitive education. That just simply means thinking strategies and learning strategies. And one of the big names, theorists in cognitive education, is Reuven Feuerstein. He, he passed on. But, um, but he believed in the potential of the brain to change. He went against the grain of psychology, and he said that I don't believe in IQ tests, that IQ tests has got the final say, but I believe the brain is placid, and it can change. It's flexible with the right kind of stimulation. And he wrote a book about Down syndrome people. And the title of the book is, You Love Me? Exclamation mark. Don't accept me as I am. I'm going to say it again. You love me? Don't accept me as I am. Except, expect more from me because I can achieve more. Yes. Amen? And that's God's heart for you. All right? The potential that he's placed inside of you is amazing. And that must also be the dynamic that works in our relationships. Amen? Are you ready for the third I mention? Right? Are you ready? Okay. Um, so it, it, it always protects, it always trusts or believes. Third one, it always hopes. 
It always hopes. And I, I'm, again, I'm not going to repeat what Pastor Peter said, but just touch again, reiterate, underline some of the aspects that he said in the context of love. In Romans chapter 5, it speaks about the process, how we arrive to build the kind of hope that Pastor Peter spoke about. All right? So just, I'm just going to read it. And um, it says, not only so in verse 3, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, in our sufferings, in our sufferings, in our sufferings. I'm repeating it that you can hear it. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. Not a wish list, the kind of hope that Pastor Peter spoke about. So this means that love understands that there's a process that you and I should go through to bring us to a place where we are mature, where we've got a strong anchor, and where we can be stable. And it starts with difficult. It starts with suffering. It starts with being uncomfortable. And then, as Pastor Peter indicated, to wait and to persevere and to keep on and not to run away and to stay in the place and to remain faithful and allow the process to work, even though the, it's hot, even though the fire is around you and it burns, it's uncomfortable, you remain in the process because that's God's discipline, that's God's heart for you. Up to the point where God is building character inside of you. Maturity is standing up. You're growing in strength. You're standing up. God is building something in you. And that produces something that we call hope. A strong anchor that will keep you anchored. Amen? So what am I saying? I'm saying to you, sometimes we ask questions about God. And we say, how can a God of love allow this in my life? And not, I'm not saying that all bad things in your life is from God. That's not what I'm saying. But I know Romans 8 says that God works out everything for the good who, for, for those who love Him. Amen? And that means that love me, also means that sometimes you have to go through difficult situations. You have to persevere and you have to be, be uncomfortable so that God can bring in maturity in you. So James Dobson is writing a book. And one of his book is called, Love Must Be Tough. And it also means in our relationships with one another, in discipleship, it means that sometimes love must be tough. It will not overprotect, but it will allow you to go through processes to bring in maturity inside of you. If I just do everything for my children, and I want to put them in cotton wool and not expose them to difficult situations, I'm not doing them a favor. But if I really want to build character inside of them, I really must bring in discipline. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. But I do it because I love them. And because I believe there's a potential inside of them. And this is a dimension of love that we sometimes ignore because we don't like it. But it's got part of God's pure love for you and for me. Amen. And I'm ending off with the last aspect of, of, um, of love. And that is... It always perseveres. God, God's love always perseveres. So the picture that I just see in the spirit is this ox that's yoked in with another ox. And together they pull forward. If it's tough, if it's hot, if it's dusty, if it's rainy, whatever the circumstances, we will persevere and we will carry on. You know what? That's God's heart for, that is God's heart for you. No matter what you do or don't do, no matter how you mess up or, what you, or how good you are, doesn't matter what. God will remain faithful in terms of His covenant with you. He will always persevere in the relationship. I shared this morning about my own brother. He passed away in April and um, he had a rough life. Many challenging situations, many wrong choices. And I can say this now as a testimony because he's with the Lord. But my mother persevered in prayer. And, um, and I have to say, I believe always in, also in fasting. 
she did not stop to pray for him. And God did not leave him alone. And six weeks before he died, six weeks before he died, a friend that he knew from primary school invited him to a, to a ser- service, Sunday evening service. And my brother gave his heart to the Lord. And the night before he passed away, he was um, you know, having a braai with other people, the people where he rented a little flat from. And they were sitting at the fire. And he shared with the lady and he told her, you know what, I'm ready to go. My, um, my relationship with God is fine. I'm ready to go. And a couple of hours later, you know, he just passed on through a heart attack. Praise God that he will always persevere. He will leave the 99 and he will go and look for you. That's his heart for you and for me. And I also believe that that is what we should carry in our hearts towards one another. You know, we human, we make mistakes. We hurt one another. We offend one another. But that is no reason to give up in our relationships with one another. Husband, wife, any marriage sometimes go through difficult times. Siobhan and I went through difficult times. If I reflect um, um, through our marriage life, sometimes we're difficult. Life happens. There are circumstances. But are you going to honor the covenant that we have with one another? You are yoked in, and you're not going to climb out. We're going to persevere because that's the kind of love that God pours out in your heart. Also with one another in this congregation. I'm going to ask you, are we just giving up with one another? Our friendships, our discipleship, our relationships. Somebody offends me, I pack my bag and I go. Or how committed are you in the kind of love that God has poured out? Out in your heart. Amen. So I'm going to ask Pastor Peter and Pastor Conrad also to come to the front. I believe that um, God really wants to shift something in in your heart tonight. Um, Maybe it's something that Pastor Conrad shared um, in terms of of faith. And um, I'm going to ask him to pray for you. And as he does, just reach out to God. God really God really can come and do something in your life. And then the same with Pastor Peter, um, as he, what he shared in terms of hope. Um, I believe there are some of you sitting here that God really wants to come in and just bring that, that anchor of hope in your life. And then I will end off with a prayer about love. Amen. Father, thank you for your faith in us, that you love us, that you believe in us, that you rejoice over us. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll teach us how to see what God is saying, what the Father is saying to us, the song that he's singing over us, the plans that he has for us. Help us to see with the eyes of faith what you are saying to us. God, teach us how to become sensitive to that so we can step out 100% into what you say, Lord, that we will not look around at our circumstances or reason or evaluate with our logic and common sense. But, Lord, that your word will override everything else. Lord, that we can just lay our lives down on that because we know that you are not a man that you should lie. And that your word is faithful and true, that your character is constant. And God, teach us how to walk in that faith, that we will not be disappointed because we know that you are reliable, Lord. You are faithful and you are true. In Jesus' name. Lord, we just pray that um, that you help us to find refuge in you. Help us to find refuge in you, our hope. Help us to find refuge in you, the anchor, the anchor of our hope, the hope of glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, where some of us might still be or going down uh, this hole of hopelessness. Lord, I pray that you help us out. I pray that you help us to, to hope again. I pray that you strengthen us in our hope, Lord. I pray that you help us to build ourselves, to fortify ourselves, that our hope will be strong. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that we will, yeah, that we will position ourselves, position ourselves for that invasion of faith, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for a breakthrough in each of our lives, a breakthrough that we can hope again, that we can hope again that we can hope again and that we can hope 
with the hope that you give. We align ourselves with your hope in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your love that you demonstrated in Christ Jesus for each one of us. Father, thank you that it is a love that brings us to a place of wholeness. And I pray for every person here, including myself, Lord, in those areas where we still need healing, where we feel broken, where we are broken in our, in our humanness. Father, I just pray that you, will, that you will touch us in those areas through your love. Father, we don't want to cover up. We won't, don't want to hide away. But, Lord, we choose tonight to open up those areas. I pray for every person that needs to go and speak to a leader or a trusted friend in you, Father, that you will guide them through your spirit to open up, Father, and that your spirit will just come and bring healing in a new level and a new way into their lives. Father, thank you for, for your love that, that believes in the potential that you've built and placed inside of us. I pray for every person here that you'll open up to them anew the plans and the dream that you've got for them, Father. Help us also towards one another that we will believe in, um, in the dreams and, and the plans that you've got for other people that you've placed in our lives and around us. Lord, help us to be prophetically accurate and pursue that and that that reality will be our reality in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for hope. Thank you that your love just drives forward hope, Father, and help us not to climb out of the processes, but, Father, to experience your love in, this, in these uh, processes of discipline. Even if it's uncomfortable, Father, help us that we can understand and see your heart in this. Lord, we, we I, and maybe some of us, have shied away in bringing discipline into the lives of those we love. Forgive us, Father, for that. And Lord, we want to align us with your word. Help us, Lord, also to bring that dimension of your love into the lives of people, to develop them because you believe in them and you see potential in them. And Father, lastly, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you remain in covenant with us through the blood of Jesus Christ, irrespective of what we do. Lord, it's, it's, it's like that song says, we don't deserve it, but Father, you still remain faithful, even oftentimes when we are unfaithful. We just thank you for that. But Father, I pray for every person here. I specifically pray for every marriage. I pray for every godly friendship. I pray for every godly relationship um, with ourselves in this congregation. Lord, help us to remain faithful. Help us not to climb out of relationship, but to rock up for the relationship, Lord, in you. And that we will keep on pushing and uh, be faithful also towards one another. Lord, we just thank you for that. That I want to bless each person here tonight. I want to thank you for the rain that's falling outside. And Lord, we also want to take it um, that, that there will be spiritual rain that you're going to pour out over this congregation and this city as you've declared also in this prophecy. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.